Before we begin today, I want to ask you an important question. How do you define yourself? What makes you different from your neighbors, friends, enemies, and the rest of the world? And what have you gone through trying to find the answer? A bright sunny day in Miami, a young boy is being chased by a group of boys. The audience is unsure yet of whether this is a game or a hunt, but from the look of the nervously shaking camera, it surely doesn't feel like a playful situation for the boy. He hides inside a condemned building, and we hear this. From this cranked up volume of the door being pounded, we can deduce that the film is focusing on this boy's perspective. And accordingly, the aforementioned camera movement becomes extremely important and revealing, as the young boy we are following, and will be following for this act, will turn out to be very reserved. Proving this point, the camera moves and jumps with the boy, uncomfortable, confused in terror, zoomed in, only seeing glimpse of things. Soon, a man shows up. This man is unlike the boy in every way. He is confident, grounded, and all-knowing. The camera, when following the man, whose name is Juan, smoothly moves around, circling others and painting this ghetto neighborhood with no uncertainties, wide in its view. He knows the ins and outs, on top of the hierarchy, a respected man with power. The boy is on guard. The camera is careful and there is no connection, visualized by the hard cuts between the two. This is how the film opens up with an unlikely but a predestined encounter. And with this clash, the film announces its central theme, the strive for self-awareness and enlightenment. The boy is little. The two are now in a restaurant. Little, half-dragged by Juan, is still quiet, but the camera isn't. Over the course of their stay, the camera zooms in ever so slightly, still maintaining its hesitance, but at least closer. We too are forced in this awkward exchange as the camera places itself in between the two. In fact, such participation is encouraged and hinted throughout the film. We are not a spectator, but a character. Little opens up to Juan with time, thanks to his firm but cautious and sincere approach. The camera is still shaky and unsteady, like Little, afraid and unsure but it starts to pan between the characters. A faint connection is being formed. This is very comparable to when Juan's girlfriend, Teresa, is introduced. The camera goes back to hard cuts like it did for Juan back in the building. Further clarifying this trick, in the dining scene we see a very smooth panning between the characters. It's not handheld anymore because this pan is for Juan. And it shows his connection to the characters around the table, and especially of Little, who now reveals his name as Sharon. Give it a try. Whenever Chiron shuts down Juan's pursuit for a connection, there will be a very noticeable cut instead of a pan, at least until Chiron is actually comfortable around them. My name is Chiron. People call me little. What's interesting is that despite the film being all about the search for identity, Chiron actually seems to have the clearest idea of who he is as little. His lack of self-awareness is logical given his young age. If anything, his endeavor for self-actualization is praiseworthy in its maturity. His mother, who seems off from the start, may have been a contributing factor, but we aren't too certain yet. Why you didn't come home like you're supposed to? Huh? Next, we get acquainted with Kevin, who as far as we can tell is Sharon's only friend. Kevin has just come back from being tackled by the boys instead of Sharon from a harsh game of smear the queer they used to call it and is basically telling Sharon to step up to show the world that he ain't soft if he doesn't want to be bullied around. And in this short exchange of words, we hear a critical phrase that shapes the rest of the film. Sharon answers Kevin saying, But I ain't soft. And Kevin says, But it don't mean nothing if they don't know. In other words, knowing who you are is less important than letting others know who you are, or in a more extreme way than who others think you are, regardless of its accuracy. 
With this, the nickname Little resonates within us. The world is slowly shaping Sharon. Less evident on screen but factually correct according to the script, this moment after their innocent wrestle is the first time Sharon fully returns the stare to someone. This indirectly informs the audience that Kevin, possibly except Juan, is the only person to authentically see Little as who he really is. Sharon. And the rest of the film becomes painless to decipher as long as we remember that the film is a giant tug of war between the people who see Sharon and the people who create Sharon, with Sharon himself standing in the middle, contemplating which side to choose. Where he stands in each scene is illustrated by different ingredients of the film, like sound, color, and the setting. And there is one symbolic element that embodies and makes use of all these ingredients to tell the underlying story. Water. After the central message has been announced by Kevin, the next scene follows Sharon visiting Juan's place again in desperate need of love and attention. It gets more and more apparent that Juan is a father he never really had, someone who he can look up to. Together they go to the beach where he teaches Sharon how to swim. There are many ways to decode what water may represent in this film, from showcasing significant life events, to it being Sharon's inner state, turmoil, and life itself. It isn't clear at first, but the film openly speaks of its meanings as the plot thickens, which we'll get to. But basically, among many possible interpretations, Juan teaching Chiron how to swim can be a sign of teaching him how to live and stand on his ground, how to navigate through this world. In a way, he's changing, almost as if being baptized for the first time, into a new identity under the wings of his surrogate father. And he, like Kevin, also delivers an extraordinary tale that both Sharon and the audience must pay attention to. A person turning blue under the moonlight, like the shade of the water in the film, is yet another crucial symbol relating to the concept of self. Say your name, Blue. <laughs> nah. At some point, you gotta decide for yourself who you want to be. Can't let nobody make that decision for you. For the first time, someone in his life has argued for striving against the expectation of the world, to be who you are. For now, it's unclear if this symbol serves as a vulnerability that triggers the ability to ignite one's true self, or if it serves as a simple warning against defining oneself based on the environment. But it's okay, neither Sharon nor the audiences are supposed to have a definitive answer at this point. Like how Sharon is too little to get his head around this right now, so are we at this stage of the narrative. Sharon as little is observing things, and expressing himself the best he can in forms that are not words. And he's simply learning and reacting to the world. He has a potential to be something by learning more about himself, but the world keeps forcing ideas into him, and planting an ideal image of what he should be as well as what he seems to be. Every incident, albeit small and sometimes regular, takes Sharon away from the driver's seat of his life, inch by inch. And that's another thing to keep in mind, that many of the events that occur on screen are mundane and dull. A few steps away from it all, the happenings are anything but dramatic. However, these negligible episodes are what shape a person in a long run, and that's what Moonlight wishes to paint. And therefore, the tricks are brilliant here. The forced participation of the audience created by the clever camera movements generate intensity in these events. And even when they aren't dynamic enough, the film never fails to teach us the focal points by the aforesaid symbolisms. As a beautiful example, what happens after this seemingly insignificant daily routine is Sharon entering his home and noticing that the TV is missing. An object that allowed escape, gone. And gone because of his mother's growing addiction. A small change that speaks loudly. Instead of the typical drama and exposition, Sharon dumps a bucket of boiling water into the tub sits down quietly and takes a hot bath. Here he's trying his best to deal with his pain, his loneliness, unconsciously wishing for love and attention that he lacks from his mother. The absence of warmth replaced by the hotness of the water. 
and in silence he connects the dots. Juan, who tries his best to be a good man, at the end of the day is a drug dealer who ironically contributes to the downfall of Chiron's life. As Chiron asks painful questions about his sexual orientation, Juan's true identity, and his mother's addiction, we see Juan broken down and in shame. With this, little is permanently altered. The first thing to consider now is how the initial tug of war of self-awareness has evolved with little becoming Chiron. The chapter begins with Chiron protecting his identity. I'm sorry, Mr. Pierce. You just having woman problems today. Ain't that right, Little? All right, Terrell, that's enough. I can't be enough for Little. Don't call me that. Hey, yo, what you gonna do? Chiron? He no longer wishes to be called Little as he isn't short anymore, but predominantly because this name creates exposure to his weakened self-esteem, negative memories, and brings about destruction to his effort of finding his true self causing him to shift toward the ones that try to create him in this tug of war. This small detail is what reveals his state of mind in this chapter. It's evident that he's on the verge of breaking down. It's only implied but Juan is now dead and his mother is even deeper into her addiction. Again, recall that these seemingly powerful events are only briefly dealt with. The movie instead depicts the small things, because sometimes what is intimate is stronger than what is intimidating. There's nobody to save him and he's barely holding on. But the world constantly pushes him down either on purpose or by mistake. You think all this just started, boy? I ain't no boy. The hell you ain't. If you were a man, there'll be four other knuckleheads sitting right next to you. In a way, we already know what'll happen in this chapter. Even Teresa, according to the original screenplay, explicitly mentions that if Chiron doesn't wish to be called Little, he has to earn it and make the name true. That being a man doesn't mean anything if others don't see him that way. Being Little is an insult first, but a source of confusion more than anything. Yeah. Okay. I feel you. Alright. The only person he does have is Kevin, who for some reason calls him Black. Gotta go, alright, before the school changes mind. Alright, kid. See you, Black. Still a name, but at least it's not little. Sufficient to generate curiosity in Sharon's mind, as Kevin sees something in Sharon that nobody else, including Sharon himself, sees. And in such desperate times, it's effortless to fall in love with someone like Kevin. This is where his sexual orientation becomes noticeable to all. In his dream, he sees Kevin in line with the story he told Sharon at school, sleeping with a girl. His gaze is enough to express sexual interest and also the sound of waves. This is the second thing we must consider in this chapter, how the concept of water and blue has evolved. Now there's the sound of waves and a soothing breeze that touches his soul. The wave displays his truest self. They are rough and can be scary, like how confronting one's true identity can be tough. And consequently, the scene at the beach is likewise a time he is true to himself. Seeing that wave hit the water, which speaks for his nervousness yet again, the breeze that stops everything, as pointed out by Kevin, and the water. Should I cry so much sometimes, I feel like I'm gonna just turn to drops. He's letting life be transitioning into understanding who he truly is. This is a scene that brings everything together, all the symbols into one. Even the brightness of the moon is subtly there for us, the metaphor for how people see others and identify them by the light that is shining on them instead of seeing the real person. Except here, they see through the blue as Kevin and Sharon. The push and pull between Sharon initiating his true move and the outside world blocking his steps by labeling him finally comes face to face when he's circled by the outside and faced with Kevin. Hey. 
Sharon washing his face with ice cold water, not just after the beat up, but when he is all grown up, is representative of his numbing of his true feelings. He is trying hard to forget about his need for love, in a way ironically revealing that he is extremely lonely and that he needs love. He has lost everything, his mother, Juan, Kevin, and himself. A stronger pull means a stronger push. He takes action, but with it, losing a part of himself. He decides to give the world what is sought. There are a couple of things that stand out. First, he very much resembles Juan, the only person he knew as an example of acceptable masculine figure. His looks are one thing, but another detail is the crown figure on his car's dashboard. It's strikingly similar to the one his surrogate father had. The only difference is that there is a tint of black. And that's the second thing, he now embraces black as his name, the one given by Kevin. We learn that after that life-changing day, he moved to Atlanta and was put in a juvie where he eventually began drug dealing. As the last memory in Miami was both a warm and a cold one, it does make sense that Sharam might use that name to never forget what made him be. But on the other hand, this revives Juan's earlier tale of blue and leaves a bittersweet taste in our mouth. Perchance Black gave in and accepted his given name, unlike Juan. And this is why the last act is especially imperative. Throughout the film, Sharon and the audience with him is searching for his identity and the way to express it. But what he ends up with instead is everything he despised. He poses and breathes intimidation, one thing he knows he abhors, and talks in all ways that isn't him. He has become someone the world wishes him to be, and with that he can never truly communicate and open up to his environment. And it shows, he can't sleep at night. He still deliberately washes his face in cold water. In fact, he only drinks water. He works out to drain his energy and to numb his emotions. But he still cries. He still loves his mom. Everything is repressed. That's until one day, Kevin calls. Hey, Black. I mean, uh, Sharon. The sudden change in his facial expressions are brilliantly done, enough to convey a sense of longing and vulnerability. He drives to Miami, which is at least a 10 hour drive from where he resides. An open gesture of love, determination, and his desperate wish for escape. He meets Kevin to finally open up and let go, acknowledge himself. He wishes to seek, grow, look up to, and eventually be loved and love openly. So on a brighter side, Black may be a positive name, an optimistic foreshadowing of the ending. We recall that Kevin was the only one to call him black, but unlike Juan, this may have been the true color of Sharon. After all, he wasn't nicknamed Blue. It's conceivable that Sharon's love and curiosity toward Kevin was not just for their connection, but an unconscious attempt of trying to understand who he is through Kevin. Let's go back to the question. How do you define yourself? Sharon's inner world has deteriorated has been invaded and altered by his surroundings with time. But he wouldn't have learned at all if it wasn't for the genuine care and love of those around him, entering his reserved and distant mind. It's the expectation and force of the society that has made him stumble, but it's also the guidance of those with wisdom and knowledge of Sharon's true self that has kept him from completely falling. Perhaps he knew from the start who he is. He just wasn't ready to accept it until now. It's without a doubt important to know who you are from within before turning to the world for an answer, but it's also important never to confuse search with submission. In the end, Sharon too reaches out to the one person who saw him in his true color, even under the moonlight that shines blue on black, and decides to be the real black, the real Sharon, the real little, as he morphs back into his younger self, who turns around and gently stares at us. His stare is innocent, satisfying, and warm. The sound of the mournful waves and the breeze return to both Sharon and the audience. 
and we can't help but feel a bit guilty by the stare. It's because we too can't just run away from this. And that stare is the question. What have you gone through trying to find the answer? Thanks for watching. And that's it for me.